Well, well, ladies and gentlemen, it's been a while since I put up a theory video or posted, and since I've been rediscovering my love for the Toy Story universe, it was a long time coming and the shower thoughts wouldn't leave me alone. I rewatched the Toy Story saga in between work and projects, and I stand by my opinion, which is also absolute fact. Toy Story 2 is and remains the best movie in the series, don't you dare at me. But this video here is specifically about a certain aspect of Woody's past and why being Andy's favorite was such a massive priority for him, more so than Andy's other toys, to the point of hanging his self-worth on it. Woody gets some of the best character exploration in the series, even when there's a lot of unanswered questions which fuels the theory machine. So there's been a lot of fan interpretations over the years about Woody's past, and one I 100% agree with is that, yep, Woody never had an owner before Andy. It's a little surprising that some people still talk about this as a theory, when Toy Story 2 explicitly shows us through his reaction to Jesse's own experience that he's never suffered the abandonment that comes with a child growing up, and he's terrified of the idea, it's not even a fan theory at this point, the movie literally makes it canon. Now I know about the video the Carlin brothers did on Woody's early past, and I totally recommend you watch it. The interview they did with Mike Mozart, where he talks about Joe Ramp's version of Woody's past and him being a prototype, is fascinating. I also know that Pixar representatives came out and basically said it's not canon, which doesn't surprise me. You gotta remember that this version of Woody's past is an early draft, during the early development stages in the Toy Story universe. These things go through a lot of changes and revisions, and Ranft was only one writer on the team. But I do think there are elements of that story, bits and pieces that are pretty much canon, but not the entire given story, if that makes sense. For example, it's pretty much canon that Woody is in fact an old family toy that's been in the Davis family for decades, and that he's a hand-me-down either from Andy's dad or his dad's side of the family at least. From the hints we see in the movies, my interpretation is that Woody was stored away virtually unused in Andy's family for a very, very long time. If Andy's his first real owner, then Woody would have been in storage for around 40 years from the late 50s to the early 90s. That's an abnormally long life for a toy already, and I know what some might say. Toys aren't people, they don't have organic bodies that age, and unless they're severely damaged, they are potentially immortal. But there are two problems with this theory. A. Toys do age, and we see it, just not the way humans do. As we've seen in Toy Story 2, their parts and limbs begin to fall apart, their fabrics become thin and fragile, they corrode, they malfunction, and so on. Jerry, I'll call him Jerry, the restorer who comes to Al's penthouse to restore Woody, even warns Al about the cowboy's material getting old. And B, realistically, a played with toy doesn't last long. Think about it, a toy lasting 15 to 20 years of play is considered very impressive. I think in the Toy Story universe, 30 plus is already considered old. 50 or 60, which is around how old Woody is by the end of the story, is probably seen as ancient in toy culture. Woody's time in storage, however, would be nothing like the tomb-like existence Jesse went through. He was probably just put away on a shelf in an attic or a garage, belonging to someone in the Davis family. He would have had freedom of movement, but as the movies show us, it's a toy's innate desire to be loved and played with. And so those 40 years must have been drier than the Grand Canyon. Must have been a very, very lonely time for Woody. Especially when you see how dejected and, for lack of a better word, spiritually starved Andy's toys became by the time we see them in the third movie, after not being played with for years. Which is pretty interesting, because if you go back and watch that scene again, Woody's the one who shows the least fear when it comes to the idea of going into attic mode. Everyone else, even Buzz, is scared by the idea. Jessie's battling her own demons, obviously, while the other toys are just scared. Woody, however, is just resigned. And what does he say to comfort them? He tells them to hold tight, stick together, and that one day Andy will have kids of his own and hopefully they'll be played with again. Woody is no stranger to storage in an attic, and of all the toys, he's the one handling the play deprivation the best. Even when the rest of the toys want to try living at the daycare to at least have a taste of playtime again, Woody holds back. 
being outgrown by his kid is a new experience for him, but not being played with for a long time is definitely not. This brings us to why Woody absolutely adores Andy and has a special connection with him. As someone from a family that passed on heirlooms from grandparents, uncles, and the like, let me explain from experience a theory I have on how Woody first came into the possession of someone in the Davis family, like a grandparent or a great-uncle. It is extremely likely that someone in Andy's family used to work at the factory creating Woody's Roundup toys back in the 50s. The show eventually got cancelled and the toy line went out of production. This family member, however, managed to keep some of the toys, thinking he can pass them down to the children in his family. In fact, it's actually very likely that this family member managed to keep more than one Woody doll around to give to the family children. So, no kid would be jealous that their cousin got a cowboy doll and they didn't. Which is just hilarious to me. Imagine Al's aneurysm after years of trying to find these extremely rare Woody dolls, only to discover some family a few blocks away may be casually sitting on like four or five. Eventually, our Woody came into Andy's possession and he was an immediate favorite. A child's imagination is almost like a drug to the toys in this universe. So can you imagine what it must have felt like after 40 years of nothing to getting a full blast of Andy's imagination and love during playtime? Honestly, if the opening sequence we see in Toy Story 3 is what toys actually experience for real in their minds and souls when their kid owner plays with them, I'd never want to let go either. To Woody, it's 40 years of waiting and hoping and not giving up till it finally paid off. And that long way paid off in the best way possible because he was not only a toy, he was the favorite toy, which is something else entirely. So he went from being alone in storage to being given the best life a toy could ever dream of. It was a zero to hundred transition from dark to light, from no friends to having all the friends with no in between. And Woody basked in that sudden shower of privilege. Consider this and you'll understand the depth of jealousy and bitterness he feels when Buzz, aka out of the sky comes some little punk in a rocket as the song goes, arrives and in no time, no time at all, snatches the title of being Andy's favorite. In Woody's mind, Buzz didn't earn it at all. He got the status, the love, the playtime, the attention and even Woody's friends merely by being a shiny space toy. And that was something Woody knew he could never compete with because he's an old-fashioned toy and he knows it. Quick side note, this is an interesting parallel between Woody and the Prospector. Woody felt he deserved and was entitled to Andy's love after waiting for decades and he almost hurt Buzz to take back what he felt was rightfully his. And Pete also felt entitled to a life of being appreciated and immortalized after decades of no child ever choosing him. And he was willing to hurt Woody in the process. Now back to Woody's jealousy over the entire situation with Buzz. To understand the depth of resentment Woody felt during that time, remember that it wasn't just that Buzz was becoming Andy's new favorite. Woody was furious because Buzz didn't even care that he was Andy's favorite. Buzz was still completely in his delusions at the time, talking about fixing his ship, getting off the planet to save the universe, and acting like being in Andy's room is all an inconvenience he has to deal with because he has more important places to be. And Woody standing there seething because having Andy and actually living his purpose as a toy amongst toys instead of withering away in an attic somewhere is everything he's ever wanted. He's been finally given paradise and Buzz just gets handed it with no effort and in no time and he's just crapping all over it. He doesn't care. He never wanted it. We the audience know of course that Buzz didn't do anything wrong and that Woody was still Andy's favorite. And once Woody finally realizes this and comes to term with his own fears and insecurities, his real metal, the loyal and protective cowboy sheriff he truly is, shines through. So I'll leave it here guys, hope you have fun listening to this interpretation and let me know if you'd like me to make more Toy Story Theory videos like this. I will if there's enough interest, so you gotta let me know. I'd like to talk about all the movies, regardless of the fact that the fourth one is a massive disappointment and an hour and a half of my life I'll never get back. Three hours if you consider I had to re-watch this thing to talk about it in a future video. 
So please like the video and subscribe. I'll be happy to read about your own Toy Story theories down in the comments. And until next time.